Hi everybody, it's Dr. Sandy Laura Kramers coming to you from Visionary Eye Doctors and just wanted to say thank you to all our listeners for joining us for episode number 13, our podcast on floaters. And we're gonna, it's gonna be kind of more interesting a little bit than that, but we'll talk a little bit about that. And I wanted to say thank you to all our subscribers and those who have sent in emails and messaged me about suggestions and comments and questions. And those patients that have come in to Visionary Eye Doctors to say thank you for the podcast and of course to visit with us for their eye care. Uh, so as many of you know, uh, I am a surgeon. And so one of the things that we kind of always laugh about as surgeons and doctors is that when you go to a social event, you always get asked medical questions. So last night, um, very ironically, because a friend of, uh, of, of my friend's father had asked me this similar question earlier by text. Uh, but when we went to this back to school night last night, uh, we had a wonderful time with the headmaster uh, giving an incredible talk that I, I do want to share it with you because it was so priceless. But with the reception before and the reception after, uh, we met some new families and new parents. And of course, as soon as I get introduced as a surgeon, eye surgeon, I have the, the it came up. The question, you know, the question about something that the patient had or the person had. And so as physicians, we laugh about this, like the dermatologist, whenever they get asked or they're told, you know, somebody says, oh, this is a dermatologist. Like, oh, what's this on my hand or what's this on my face or how do I get rid of this acne or whatever, right? Ophthalmology, we have three key categories of questions we get asked. And and we always uh, kind of laugh and some, some doctors laugh because they say, oh, were you asked any kind of free advice and things like that? And I always found that kind of free advice kind of annoying because it's not, I mean, of course you want to help your fellow man, you know, you want to help your fellow woman. Why do you, why do you care? You know, I don't mind. Um, and a friend of mine would apologize every time her parents would, you know, get me after church and say, oh, can I ask a question about my eyes? Or, you know, I don't mind that actually. But anyway, so this is what happens. So our three key categories as, as eye surgeons, eye doctors that we get asked at social events and cocktail parties and so forth. Uh, the first one is vision. I can't see. Why can I not see anymore when I look up close? The answer is you need glasses. You're over 40, you're around 40 years old. Easy fix, right? Or you know, my, I can't, I, my glare, my glare when I drive at nighttime is bothering, you know, bothering me. Most likely a cataract. Come in and see me. That's category number one. Number two is dry eye. That's the second most common, the dry eye. Oh, I have this constant irritation in my eyes driving me crazy. Or why, am, why is my eye tearing all the time? Or uh, kind of, you know, why is my eye so dry? You know, that kind of thing. Or I have just this, this pain at the end of the day or in those kinds of the dry eye questions. And the third most common, which we haven't talked about on the podcast yet, is floaters. And that's a very common one. So I got two questions last night about, oh, what's this thing that's moving around in my, my vision is driving me crazy. Another person's like, I have this little black spot that just kind of stays there. It just won't go away. Uh, and actually a, a third patient said her daughter had kind of this weird light sensation in her back of her eye. And it's kind of, you know, seemed like it was moving a little bit. So that's kind of the category number we're going to talk about today. So we're going to talk about floaters, but let me just quickly take in a little aside to just share with you this great, great story that our headmaster, our beloved headmaster talked about at our back to school night last night, because I learned a lot. So my husband and I really felt like we were just back to school taking notes and really trying to and absorb the wisdom of this this man. Uh, he's very knowledgeable when it comes to boys and, and, and children, but we learned a lot. So he talked a little bit about the four runners trying to run a race. And I will butcher this because I do not have the notes from last night. But what I do remember is one of the key stories he told. And I just want to say a little bit about this. So with any child, many of us are, you know, children ourselves. We're all learning. Uh, we have children, we have grandchildren or something. So I want to talk to you about the forerunner. So the end line, right? Of course, ideally for most people, it's heaven, you know, live a good life, heaven, right? And there's four runners trying to get there. And the first runner is the physical runner, right? The physical runner, the physical development of yourself and your or your child or whoever you're talking about. And you're trying to run this race well, right? So you're, you're trying to improve your muscles, improve your health, eat well, do all the right things. You know, all those kinds of things are very important. The second runner is the academic runner. So the runner that's trying to learn something new every day and trying to really absorb the knowledge around you and trying to use it for good and that kind of stuff. The academic runner is very important. 
The third runner is a spiritual runner, the runner that's kind of trying to basically have maybe a communion with nature or God or, you know, Jesus Christ or whatever it is, right? So that spiritual runner is very important. And the fourth is the virtuous runner, the person who is trying to kind of create a, a level of virtue in the, the, the himself or herself or the people around them. And one of the things, and I, I know I'm butchering this a little bit, but I think what I took home was the most important runner is actually the fourth one. If you can elicit your will, especially in a child, if you can elicit the will, you've won the race. All four runners are going to get there. And we're all, every, there's four runners in every single one of us, right? So the idea is that you're trying to make a child to want something and make their will want it. And how do you do that? If you can make somebody want to do something, then they're going to want to do it. And it's going to be a good outcome. If you're just pushing them, and so his example was, if you're a mother or father that's like a helicopter mother and constantly correcting everything they do and doing everything for them and constantly just like, you know, on top of them for everything, you're not really allowing that child to elicit their will. The same thing if you're a boss. If you're a boss and you're micromanaging every step, step of the way, you don't give your employees a chance to step up and show what they can do. And it just kind of leaves them with this kind of sensation like, well, why bother, right? And that can happen to any of us and especially to kids. So the one story he told, which I thought was brilliant, is that a bunch of the students had gone to the Grand Canyon many years ago or a couple of years ago, I guess now. And there was this situation where everybody had gotten to the main camp uh, really high up, they were at the bottom, and there was one kid, one student, who was very far behind, and he was carrying a huge backpack, and he just couldn't get up there, and it was, he was very, very far behind. So the teachers were thinking about, what do we do? It's getting dark, and this is a boys' school, so you can imagine that you know they're 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 more a little bit more you know free free wielding that way. Um, but they so they had the fastest kid go help that other kid. So the fastest kid ran down pretty far away and brought up his backpack, his, his huge, you know, back, pack, his pack. And there's like, well, where's the kid? And he's like, oh, he's just slowly, he just can't, he's just slow, he just can't make it. So they said, go back and help him come up. So the kid went back and he literally, you know, was initially holding him and then kind of then pushing him up the, up the really steep incline. And by the end, the teachers were kind of shocked because the kid was like literally leaning back and just letting this kid push him up this steep incline. And the point of it, what I took home, was that if you are just kind of being pushed through life and you're being pushed to kind of, you have no investment in this. You have no investment in conquering this mountain or conquering whatever it is we're trying to conquer, right? You have to elicit your will. And that includes whatever you're trying to motivate your child or yourself to do. And so the other thing he said, which I thought was very brilliant, is if you, if you tell somebody or a kid, for instance, go run, you know, go run some laps around that track, they're gonna be kind of like, you know, way where it might take them who knows how long. There's no goal, there's no like incentive, right? Uh, and he said, if you tell them, if you run three laps around that track within, you know, four, four minutes, I'll take you to go eat some steak. That child's gonna do everything they can to make it because they want that steak or whatever it is that their, their love language is, right? Or if you tell a child, go do your homework, they could take them five hours, you know? They could just like be, you know, daydreaming and all that kind of stuff, but if you say, Let's see how many problems you can do in 30 minutes or 10 minutes or 15 minutes. Or, you know, why don't you do one hour of reading? Don't talk for one hour, just read. No TV, just read for one hour. And then we'll go grab a bite to eat outside or go for a walk or, you know, do something fun, you know? So those kinds of things I thought were beautiful because it shows human nature and it shows the ability of all humans in, in many respects to kind of find an internal motivation to kind of get through the day or get through your, you know, your challenges that you have. So I wanted to share that with you because it was so lovely and so brilliant. And uh, we're convincing, we're trying to convince this particular headmaster to write a book. So I'll keep you posted. Hopefully he will. Um, but going back to floaters. So the, the, that after, after that wonderful talk, I got my second question about floaters. And so I thought this is the time to do it. So let me tell you a little bit about floaters. We all get them pretty much. And there's some risk factors to getting floaters. So here's our eyeball. And so as you know, the eyeball has a front surface called the cornea. And then there is the iris, the colored part of the eye. 
Then there is the clear lens, which should be clear, and it becomes a cataract as we get older. It can, there's many kinds of cataracts. This is a very dense nuclear cataract. We'll just briefly go through this anatomy since we're here. And then there is the cortical cataract, which kind of looks like this. So I compare this to a pillow in a pillowcase. The pillow is what gets really, really thick and, and really, really uh, dense, like almost like a rock when it's very this kind of way. This is more like the inside covering of the pillowcase is getting kind of whitish hazy. That's called a cortical cataract. Uh, there's one on the back part of the lens called a posterior subcapsular cataract. So that's the cataract area here. But the majority of the eye is created by this clear gelatinous, what's called extracellular matrix called the vitreous body or vitreous. And what this vitreous does is like a gelatin, which is made up of collagen, various kinds of collagen, collagen 2, collagen uh, 5 and 11, collagen 7, collagen 9, all these collagens form fibrils. And they create a matrix that allows light to pass through. So the vitreous has some very important components that make your eyeball your eyeball and keep your eyeball healthy. First, it protects the retina. It kind of also helps the it attaches to the retina, which is the kind of film of the, like the, if you think of an old type of camera that had a film in the back that you would go and get developed, it's, this is the kind of retina part here. And so the vitreous attaches to the retina and it protects the retina. It kind of, we think that the vitreous is partly made by some retinal cells, which is kind of interesting. And so it creates an optical place where the light can actually penetrate into the macula, which is what you see me with. You're seeing me with your macula, your rods, your, your cones, which are the colored part of the macula, see me, the color of my clothes and, and see the world. You see that with your macula. So the vitreous provides, we think, some nutrition, support, protection, and optical component and structure, pretty much structure. So if the vitreous is kind of, let's say we break open the eye, we rupture the globe and the vitreous comes out, obviously that's a problem. The eyeball collapses, you know, the eyeball literally collapses and not like a balloon, but it more like a kind of like a, like a balloon filled with gelatin or jello that it would just kind of like to start to shrink. So the vitreous is very important. And as we get older, or if we have something called myopia, which is nearsightedness, we've talked about this in previous podcasts, the eyeball kind of grows either because of genetics, a lot of near work, screen time, you make your eyeball grow. It can change the collagen a little bit faster. So the majority of the vitreous is made of water, about 98 to 99% of water. There's uh, hyaluronase in there and collagen, some sugar, glycans, glycans, um, particular proteins and so forth. So that's all what's in the vitreous. But as we get older, the collagen, and we think collagen 9 makes collagen 2 become exposed, which causes the collagen fibers to clump together. So what happens, I compare it to gelatin. So let's say you have a beautiful tray of jello gelatin without any fruit, but just you know, a beautiful tray and you leave it on your counter. Over time, it's gonna form these clumps and it's gonna be really yucky, right? It's not gonna be nice and smooth. And that's what happens to the vitreous. It forms these clumps that the collagen fibers are clumping and then you start to see floaters. And what that reason is, is because the light shines and then when you have these tiny little microscopic clumps in the vitreous, it create casts a shadow on the retina, which is the film of the eye, kind of like the film of the camera, like I mentioned. And so that's why you see these kind of dark floaters. And they usually can move. If you move your head, they'll kind of move a little bit. And most of the time, people can kind of adjust. But sometimes it drives people absolutely crazy. And so there are basically three things we can do for floaters. Number one, which we suggest in the majority of patients, is to avoid them. And, avoid, and to ignore them, sorry, <laughs> ignore them. So just try to let your brain kind of forget about them and try to look beyond them. Don't look at white, you know, walls all the time because then you'll notice it or you'll kind of, there'll be times that you really do notice it. So uh, maybe sunglasses might help, but just try to have your brain ignore them. That's number one. Number two, which we do not recommend, but we've had to do this in a few patients because it is literally driving them crazy, is called YAG vitriolysis. YAG is a type of laser that we use that we will literally take a laser, doesn't hurt, and we will dilate the pupil so it gets big, and we will use a laser, kind of like Star Wars, you know, just kind of shoot the asteroid to hit the, the, the floater. You can actually see it on the microscope and you actually hit it with the laser, and it does work. And it, it can get the 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 floater to go away. The problem is that there's risks. The risks, anytime you pump energy into the eyeball, even if it's laser energy, there's the risk that the floaters could get worse. 
you could pull the vitreous away from its attachment to the retina called a posterior vitreous detachment. And as I mentioned, the vitreous is attached to the retina. So if you do that, sometimes it causes the pulling of the retina off. It can cause a hole, a tear, and it can even detach the retina, which is technically a kind of really, really bad thing to do because it's a dev potentially devastating complication that requires major eye surgery. So those are the risks and it has happened. And there's been papers on both sides, papers that say that risk is very low, papers that say that risk is not very low. The actual number of that risk of what happens with the YAG vitreolysis has changed because the, the YAG uh, technology has improved a little bit. Our ability to focus is a little bit better on the floater. So the risk of a retinal detachment or complication is probably less than 2%, maybe even less than 1%. But their long-term randomized controlled studies have still not been done. So if it's truly driving somebody crazy, we will consent them, tell them of the risks, but then we will do it if needed. That's the, that's the second option. Um, the pulling of the retina, of the, of the vitreous away from the retina is called a posterior vitreous detachment, called a PVD, posterior vitreous detachment. And I'm men mentioning this because we have a lot of patients and even people that are listening might have noticed, all of a sudden they started noticing a burst of floaters or they see a big floater or they might've noticed a flash and they go in and get checked to make sure it's not something dangerous like a retinal detachment or tear or a retinal hole. And the doctor says, oh, you just have a PVD, posterior vitreous detachment, meaning that's part of our aging process. Most of us get a posterior vitreous detachment as we get older. There was one autopsy study that said 63% of 80 year olds had it when they did the autopsy. So it's just a little formal kind of bigger clump where the actual gelatin has pulled away from the retina. In most patients, that's not a big deal unless you have severe uncontrolled diabetes. So the second way, like I mentioned, is the YAG vitreolysis. And the third way, which is really rare, we have to do it, is called a vitrectomy, where we go into the eye with a special cutting machine and we take it out manually and we cut it and we aspirate the floater and a lot of the vitreous, we'll take it out. And so we replace it with just balanced salt solution. We think that's pretty safe and healthy for the eyeball. Uh, we don't see that many complications from that, but again, the risks are still the same. Risks of causing a hole or a tear in the retina or a retinal detachment, risk of infection causing a endophthalmitis where you could even lose the eye. And that risk is very, very low, but it's not zero. So that's those risks. So therefore, what do we wanna do? We wanna prevent floaters, number one. How do you prevent floaters? Well, for most people, it has to do with a healthy eating style. If you have diabetes or you develop diabetes, your risk of floaters is higher. So you wanna to try to stay low carbon. We've talked about that on previous podcasts. Number two, you wanna to try to avoid high myopia or even myopia. So the idea, the longer the eyeball, the more you're stretching that gelatin, that jello, that kind of vitreous, and the more you're likely to change the collagen fibrils to literally start clumping. So people with high myopia tend to have more floaters. So, you know, looking away from the screen, the 20, 20, 20 rule, looking away every 20 minutes for 20 seconds, 20 feet away. I like the 10, 20, 20 rule. So every 10 minutes do that, you know, or try to avoid excessive near work to try to avoid myopia. So those are the things you can do. And then general, probably hydration is good and that kind of stuff. A lot of it can be genetics too, which can be obviously hard to control. Um, but those are the things we wanna do is to prevent, try to prevent the floaters. And then if you have floaters, try to do what you can to try to just have your brain learn to ignore it. And if it's driving you crazy, call an eye surgeon. Okay, so I hope that helps. That's, I think, pretty much everything I can think of about floaters. If you have any questions or any comments, please let me know. Hope that was helpful. Thank you.